Jingri, Jingiwala, Nabagala, Zoe, Nawitabuwa, Wutobe, Bunjalang Jagan. Hello, how are you? My name is Zoe, and I'm a Wutabuwa woman from Bunjalang country. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in this morning for our wonderful chat and opportunity to have a yarn with some absolute legends in this space. Uh, before we do begin, I would very much like to take this opportunity to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Bidjigal peoples of the Yuru Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. With the week that has just passed, it's really important that we take the time to reflect on our past histories, our past stories, our past ancestors, and those that are still walking with us today, our elders of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our, I would like to acknowledge not only the land, the country, the waterways and the skies that continue to carry our stories, but the people whose shoulders we stand upon. Those people who have led change and who have impacted us all in so many different ways. This year, hopefully will be a better year than 2020, but today is an opportunity where we can actually ask questions that we may have from those stark images and moments that we shared in 2020 that may have challenged you in different ways. So please take the time to be kind to yourself. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples tuning in today uh, and the wonderful presenters that we've got um, today as well. This is going to be a wonderful session and very much looking forward to starting. To kick us off, we do have the wonderful Professor Robin Ewing, who is currently beside me, who is also the co-director of CREATE. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. On behalf of Professor Michael Anderson and I, we'd like to encourage you to go on the CREATE journey with us again this year. Creativity in research, engaging the arts, transforming education. Michael and I are really excited about today. We're really grateful to all our legendary presenters. We want to acknowledge just how central the arts should be in our community, in curriculum, in our lifelong learning. And, and we really want as CREATE um, members to learn much more from our Aboriginal colleagues and friends. CREATE wants to link so many of our activities with learning from our First Nations peoples, given, of course, that the arts and story are central to Aboriginal culture and curriculum. And we, have, we know that we have so much to learn. So thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, if you're not already a member of CREATE, to join us. And don't forget to, to let your friends who can't be here today to make sure that they listen to the recordings on the CREATE YouTube channel, so ably curated by Thomas. And now, it's my privilege and pleasure to hand over to Zoe, who is going to create this wonderful session today. Thank you so much. I am wonderfully joined with Maya Newell, and on Zoom, we are also joined by the absolute amazing human who is William Tilmouth from Arundel Country. Um, I'm going to let these two wonderful humans introduce themselves before we then start their presentation. And feel free to send through questions to either Maya, William or myself. Thanks so much, Zoe. Um, so yeah, I'm Maya. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant on this continent of Australia. My ancestors are from England, New Zealand um, and Japan, and I've had the privilege to grow up on these beautiful um, yet unceded lands. Um, I'd like to also start by acknowledging and paying respects to the Gadigal and Bidjigal people on whose land we're on today, and also the land of the Arunda people, Mbantua and Garo people in Borolula, whose land I've had the privilege to make um, the film in my blood run so over the last five years. Um, paying, I pay my respects to our owners and custodians, um, past, present and emerging, and also welcome any First Nations people joining us today. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge our film team who aren't here. Um, producers Sophie Hyde, Larissa Barrent um, is quite the rock star in this 
new student in this Absolutely. university <laughs> space, um, and Rachel Edwardson, our partner organisations Children's Ground and Akilita Healing Centre in Alice Springs, uh, and most importantly, those collaborating directors, Duane Hooson, Carol Turner, Megan Hooson, James Mawson, Margaret Anderson, who are in the film, and our wonderful advisors, Mrs. Abbott Perula, MK Turner, Amelia Turner, um, Jan Vadavalu, and Felicity Hayes, who's the senior nutritional owner of Alice Springs, um, and William Tilmouth, who is joining us today. So thank you to all those people for having the courage to tell this story and walking this journey with us. Um, I am, as mentioned, joined by William Tilmouth, who was a key advisor on the film, but is also the founding chair of our partner organisation, Children's Ground. Um, and of course, Zoe Kazim for this um, session for, as an impact partner from Narragona Wally. So she's going to switch hats and be part of our session. Um, William, would you like to introduce us and ground us on the country that you're from and on um, first? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, it's morning here. I don't know you guys getting around midday, I think. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, pay my respects to the traditional owners of this country. Um, Alice Springs is the name, um, but the traditional name is Mbwondoha. It's the traditional lands of the Central Islander people. And I myself am from the Eastern Aranda, which is towards the east of Alice Springs, but uh, kinship wise, we're one and the same. And uh, so it's just a geographical definition as opposed to a different uh, tribal group. So I'd like to pay my respect to them and um, all those who have passed, and there's many, um, and all those who are still struggling today to. Uh, retain and uh, own their country. I mean, just outside of Alice Springs, five kilometres away, uh, people live without water, without shelter, without anything, and um, no amenities whatsoever. So it's a stark contrast, and this film shows that too. Um, so you can see that um, the difference in, in the way society is up here. It's not just... Uh, glamour and glitter. So thank you everyone and thanks Maya and everyone else for allowing us to be on this. Thanks William. Um, so do you want to give yourself a, another intro? <laughs> another intro. Um, so as Maya mentioned, uh, I work for Narragunawali, which is the education program at Reconciliation Australia. And uh, our main objective is to support education bodies such as universities, schools and early learning services around the country in uh, properly embedding and respectfully embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives, uh, content and shaping policies in positive ways. Uh, we've got a website narragunawali.org.au that has a bevy of resources. It's completely free to sign up for as well. Um, and we encourage everyone to take a look uh, as it uh, really delves into reconciliation and all the nuances within that uh, and really supports these kind of conversations that we're having. Part of these conversations is with working with uh, such teams and individuals as Maya uh, in the In My Blood It Runs uh, documentary film um, so that we can actually provide another platform for educators to access these kinds of resources that are so important for these conversations and changing our education system uh, for the better as well. Thanks. Um, so, I suppose firstly, just thank you so much for inviting us to speak today about the film and impact campaign for In My Blood It Runs. Um, as a mixed team of Indigenous and non-Indigenous filmmakers, I want to start by making it really clear um, how we see our role. Um, over the past decade, um, working with Duan's family, you know, we've witnessed profound strengths, wisdom and determination of families who continue to fight despite active policies to forcibly remove um, and erase their identities and systems of education. So our role as filmmakers, and I suppose impact producers, which is a new term in the film industry, 
is to use the combined power of storytelling and campaigning to make space, um, hold space and hand over that space um, and power or any power that we gain along the way to First Nations communities who have been fighting for systems change in education for a very long time. The film's aim was to tell the story um, about where the system is doing harm to children like Dwan um, and also where the system is missing the strengths in children and communities like Dwan's. The adjoining impact campaign uh, is about working in partnership with communities and backing their solutions and calls for change. Um, I think um, maybe it would be a nice time just to play the trailer for anyone who maybe hasn't seen the film. How many kids do you have? Three. What one do you love? The whole three, you say? <laughs> it was really important to look after your family members. Bush medicine. It heals up your body. <laughs> Sometimes it goes to our hands. Juan is the one that I worry about the most. He's got his own mind. Right, come on in. Scora, come on. It's about the history of our country. <coughs> he claimed for the English country the whole of this new land. What happened at school? The history that we told at school, that was for white people. They don't know their culture. They don't teach them their culture. One run away from school today at about 1.30. You want to get locked up with those other kids? This is your last chance. They're not going to take my grandchildren away from me. We want our kids to grow up learning in both ways. The first one that had the magic was the first people that had the land. We want our language. We want our stories told to our children. What? What? I don't know what's going to happen after that. What? what I want is a normal life of just being me. I just felt something a memory. Um, thank you. So I thought I'd talk a little bit today about the making of the film, um, William and I will, and then about the impact campaign. So I want to start at the beginning. This sort of came about because about 10 years ago, I had the privilege to be invited by Aranda elders and leaders at Akili, the Healing Centre, to make films about the empowering work that they're doing to educate their children in language, culture and identity. And Akilida is an aranda led community space where families can come together and support each other. Um, over these years, we worked with kids as they um, went out on country for the first time with their grandmothers, recorded song lines, um, and really like held, heard kids speaking one, two, three, but in language, you know, in their first languages. And when I listened to all of these kids, I um, was really shocked to hear that most of these kids felt like failures at school. Um, and it's to no surprise because they're only measured by Western values um, and only taught in English. And Margaret Kamara Turner, who's one of the advisors on the film, she um, said very eloquently, they're always telling us to make our children ready for school, but when are they going to make schools ready for our children? And I think that really sort of hit home early in the piece when we were thinking about what this film could be. Um, I met Duan on a camp for Nagra kids, so kids that have healing powers. Um, and he um, was very smart and magnetic and really cheeky and really wanted a film made about him. Um, so we, I think, you know, what's beautiful when you watch the film is he has this beautiful way of decoding the complex world around us. And I agreed with him that he would be a really powerful conduit to lead us, you know, as settlers on this country in understanding what it is like to grow up as a First Nations child in Australia. Um, his family really wanted to make a film and um, because we'd made so many films that were internal and just for families um, for a long time, they were up for making something for the outside world. Um, and I think it's 
good to acknowledge as well that at this point we stopped and we thought really long and hard about um, how and if we should make this film. As I'm constantly reminded by our First Nations producers, um, Marissa Barrent and Rachel Edwardson, there is such a long history of misappropriation of First Nations stories and it was really vital that this film did not um, perpetuate those ongoing um, damaging representations. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have fought very hard to continue to tell stories, their stories, and it's really critical that um, they are centred in um, shaping those narratives, their own narratives. So, um, William, I was going to throw to you now and just, uh, you know, you speak so powerfully to this point um, that we've been, and we've been so heavily guided by your advice the whole way through. Um, I wonder if you'd share a little bit about the importance of communities, you know, finding and sharing um, and using their voice. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Maya. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, my role in this film uh, was as an advisor. Um, one is because I'm um, directly related to the participants of the film, Duane and his family. Um, but also because I have a understanding of um, uh, what it's like to go the other way, um, to, to go to a situation where uh, my family, uh, when I was five, was not afforded the same um, privilege to uh, decide for me what uh, they wanted to do. Um, uh, welfare decided that. And I was uh, part of the stolen generation. And um, when I look back at it now, I would have uh, loved to have the, uh, had the opportunity of my family making a decision for me uh, when I was five, as opposed to uh, the forced assimilation prescribed solution uh, that I was given. I was taken from Alice Springs, um, there were eight of us. Uh, five uh, were from a non-Aboriginal father and therefore were a lot fairer than us. And um, they were sent south to Adelaide and told that you can assimilate a lot better. And the three dark ones um, we were sent north to Croker Island Mission. And um, Croker Island is a notorious uh, uh, mission that um, was run by the Methodist at the time. And I uh, spent all my years growing up on Croker Island doing nothing but English and religion. And um, therefore, um, I lost all connection with family. I lost all connection with culture, country, language, identity um, and many many other kids did uh, had um, lost all that as well um, having left the mission in 1967 um, uh, the mission closed down but uh, once we got to the age of 14 15 year old we were literally pushed out of the mission homes and uh, had to basically fend for ourselves in a society that we hadn't grown up in, in a, in a world that we had no idea uh, what was going on. And um, ultimately, at the end of the day, many of us never made it. Never, many of us never even got this far. Uh, suicide, alcoholism, uh, you name it. Um, and the whole uh, group of kids that I was with anyway, very few of us exist today. And so I was very, very um, privileged by the family to um, ask by the family to be, be an advisor because I could see what happens when um, you, you take someone away from the foundation that is solid, a foundation that is based on identity, a foundation that is based on culture and identity and language and law and, and uh, family and community and country. And when you start taking that away and de de destroying it, which is what assimilation was about, was taking that and smashing it to bits so that you have nothing to come back to. 
that you you forever and a day asking yourself, who the hell am I? Where do I come from? And many, many kids had to experience that, never, never found out who, or knew where they, they came from. I was fortunate enough to, um, everywhere I went, people would say, are oh, you Alice Spring bloke, you Alice Spring bloke. And I made my way back home and um, I met my father and only knew him for three years of his life before he passed away. But when I met him, um, I didn't know him. He knew no one I knew, I knew no one he knew. We had nothing in common. And um, yeah, and it, I never asked the hard questions, which I should have, and he never offered them either. But he, he, we knew that we were biologically connected and we loved each other, but uh, we just had that vacuum that sat between us and uh, we never really bridged that gap. And I have that as a big regret. And one of the things with this film is that this is a solution that Aboriginal people have come up with. Simple, inexpensive, straight down the line. And um, this has prevented that young man from going down the same trail, the same road that I, I had gone down. This has prevented that young man from hitting the Dondales and then ultimately the prison systems, because that's where that conveyor belt takes you. And ultimately at the end of the day, he came to that crossroad. He came to that crossroad between Dondale and Geneva. And I'm glad he chose Geneva because I mean, that's propelled him to where, I mean, he has the ability, he has the star qualities to be able to take that on and take it on with the, um, the um, fervor and, uh, of a professional. Um, but yet he still has a long way to come because of um, the um, influences of his age group. He, the influences uh, of his uh, life is still there. And he's got to tackle those issues before he can uh, move on to bigger and better things, which I hope he does. But that was my uh, um, advice to the uh, production crew and to the families that this is exactly what we need as Aboriginal solutions for Aboriginal problems. This is exactly what we need. And, and um, we, that's one of the reasons why I'm also the, the chair of Children's Ground. Children's Ground is about strengthening that foundation, about building on that foundation, foundation, uh, working with the child from birth, uh, supporting the mother, supporting the father, employing grandfather as a cultural advisor. Dad can be the bus driver, mum can be um, the cook, you know, um, auntie could be doing art. There's all these other things that um, surround that child, that satellite around that child that could enhance that child's upbringing and foundation in, 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 and have strength in who they are, have strength in their identity, have strength in their language and their culture and their family. And that just gives them a platform that will propel them into being able to accommodate Western education. I am not against Western education, but at the end of the day, there's one piece missing in early childhood and that's that part where the foundation doesn't have to be smashed to bits. That it can be rebuilt and it can be strengthened and it can be empowered. And by empowering people, that's what you get. I mean, even today, some of the reports coming back from the children is the adult or Aboriginal educators are saying, these kids speak better than their parents in language, you know, because this is what they are taught in, they're taught in their language, but at the same time, and uh, once you have an Aboriginal educator, there you also have a Western educator, a early childhood um, expert in regards to uh, Western uh, education. And so they work concurrently and, and um, the child benefits from both. You know, Children's Ground is a, a, a movement. Um, it's not an organization, it's a movement uh, that gives the platforms um, in, in the, um, 
and I give platform um, that ad, uh, advocates for people, um, for systems change and for lifestyle change, and um, why are First Nations empowered people? And that's what we're on about: is let's do things Aboriginal. Let's not, or, you know, reconciliation is about um, blending in with white society without white society acknowledging your strengths and your uh, abilities. You know, let them come to us and say, well, hang on, how do we overcome these uh, damning statistics of children failing in school? They fail in school because that foundation, as you see in this film, has been smashed. It's been smashed and they smash it, not because they want to smash it or deliberately, it's what they're taught to do. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, um, broaden your horizons and say, well, hang on, how can I be more innovative in what I teach? You know, they don't do that. They're not paid to do that. You know, the system is set and that's the way it is. You will teach this and you will teach that. And at the end of the day, there's no uh, flexibility for them to even uh, embrace or consult with family or community in regards to that child. But anyway, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Um, Maya wrote me in on that, I tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, William. No I think um, I'll come around as well to talk a bit about Children's Ground, which is um, the organisation that Dwan's family run. But I think, um, yeah, there's been so much of your life experience as well as, um, yeah, just general guidance throughout of this. I feel like I learn constantly every day. Um, I think, you know, just based on um, that idea of sort of grounding the family's agency the whole way through production and through the impact campaign is something that, you know, William's really instilled in me. And in life. Um, and in life. <laughs> yeah, right. Give them agency, give them a choice, give them the right to make a decision. Yeah, They'll make the right yeah. decision. It's not, not stupid decisions. They'll make the right decisions. Yeah, always do. They were, um, never, so but they were never given the opportunity, Maya. Um, based on, I, st I think as well, just thinking about, you know, obviously as a film team, we decided to make the film, but we decided to put in place this model, a formal model of collaboration um, where the family were core partners and were engaged the whole way. And we found a way of formally recognising their agency authority and authority. Um, we drew from the family, um, then also from First Nations filmmakers, from organisations, both internationally and um, nationally. And Rachel, producer and I, um, used that as um, a model, I suppose, to make something that was specific for this particular family. And that would look different if you're in the education space or if you're a different film or working on a different country. But core to that approach, I suppose, is that Families were involved from the beginning, from early messaging stage, watching rough cuts, deciding on what the style of the film would be, what would be in the film, what would be out, and then on to designing what the impact campaign would look like as well. Um, you've talked, William, a little bit already about, um, about Children's Ground, um, but I might, so I might just jump to the impact campaign. And really, um, from the... Actually, we can share um, the next image on the slide, which is just some of those workshops along the way, which I think is always nice to look at. Um, it's just really beautiful bringing together all of the advisors and families um, along the way. Um, then we finished, when we finally finished the film, um, we were very lucky to have the support of Good Pitch Australia, which is how we garnered philanthropic support to be able to back this kind of filmmaking. Um, and that was, beautiful. At the end, we had a big meeting out in Bantua on country with all the families. Duan and his family from Borolula drove down, I think it's like 17 hours or so. And we had three days sitting together to talk about duty of care, releasing a film into the world, to talk about, um, like, I suppose, distribution and sharing knowledge about all of the different options and platforms that the film could be on, but also, most importantly, for them to decide what they wanted to do with the film. Um, um, can I just jump to that picture? Um, we had just the next one. Um, and that's all the families in, in Alice. And then we gathered their goals for change at a kind of high level um, guidance. And we took that to a range of impact partners that would be working nationally. So if we click
clicked for the next slide. Um, so this is, so that's all of the families working. Duan was there, you know, working out what he wanted to do with the film. We came up with four things. Firstly was to address racism, big one. Um, juvenile justice, how do we support um, therapeutic jurisprudence and um, supporting restorative approaches to juvenile justice instead of um, punitive approaches. And you would have seen some of the um, work of Duan and family over in the United Nations, where he became the youngest person ever to address the Human Rights Council in September last year and really raised the profile of the Raise the Age campaign, um, working with organisations like Change the Record, Human Rights Commission and Raise the Age. And the two education goals, um, maybe just flip to the next slide. Um, this is where we brought all of those high level campaign goals to a national level. So we had Get Up, we had NIAC, we had Children's Ground, who also all, all would work on how to actually put the family's wishes into play. Um, the two major education goals for the film um, was how do we support a First Nations led education system in Australia um, and formalise the work of families and communities that has existed, you know, for a millennia into an education system like, you know, New Zealand has, um, like some places in Hawaii, like some places in Canada. Um, it's actually a United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights um, to have education through your own culture and language, which we do not have in Australia. Um, the other one was how do we make Australian schools more culturally safe or appropriate? Or competent for First Nations children? And big question. Big question. <laughs> um, just, um, I think today I just wanted to talk a little bit in more detail on those education goals, because really the um, focus and the challenge, I suppose, is how do we amplify um, Duan's, use Duan's story to amplify the need for systems change in education. And our strategy was to use the film as a spark and a platform to amplify the voices of the First Nations organisations who have been working in, organ in education for a really long time. Um, what's the next slide? Do you want to just click to that? Okay, we can come back to the panel if you like. That's the sort of end. Um, so I just wanted to um, quickly list some of the things that we've done. We don't have heaps of time, but um, there's a group called Uchera Apanpa, which uh, is a new group of educators who are gathering from all around, I think at the moment there's 15 nations and counting, and they're working for an edu formalising that education system. So we had a federal parliament screening and premiere just before we opened In My Blood It Runs, where we invited those people to come and speak to politicians and on a panel in Parliament House. Uh, we've had over 40 policy and influencer screenings, um, including a number of state parliament screenings. We've backed Children's Ground, which William was talking about before, which I'll ask him to share a bit more about. Um, and that's actually run by Duan's grandparents who are not really waiting for government to change, but just doing it themselves. Uh, we raised over 150 for a school out in Berkanabib, which is Duan's homelands. Um, 80 plus Q&A panels all around the world and around Australia and 40 or so workplace panels um, where Sally's so jumped on <laughs> panels and William has traveled all around the world on Zoom. Um, over 600 media articles on Indigenous education, um, backing Stronger Smarter Institute, who are an amazing organization where you can go and gather training, professional development. Um, Narragunawali developed a professional development um, pack, I suppose, for teachers to um, upskill and unlearn and relearn uh, what they know. Um, NIAC Learn Our Truth campaign, which we've just um, launched, which is about teaching the true history in schools across the country, which we can talk about later. And importantly, we offered the film for over 200, two and a half thousand schools who signed up to do screenings and reconciliation week last year um, with so just education things. resources. Um, so that's pretty kind of exciting and somewhere sitting between the kind of policy level and then the practical uh, supporting schools that currently exist and teachers that need those resources. Um, so, Zoe, um, how was the film, like, yeah, how did it reflect what you understand um, to be, I suppose, some of the issues with the education system and how was it useful in your work? Great question. Um, William wonderfully touched on this uh, a little bit as well. Uh, we've typically been left out of 
history books, we've been left out of the classrooms and the teachings. Um, we haven't been talked about. Uh, my experience going through school personally was Aboriginal history, Aboriginal history started after Captain Cook. Um, and there was the government policies and all of a sudden we were in the 60s and we were learning about washing machines and all of those uh, advertisements that said women should be housewives. Um, so that was my exposure to my culture through the lens of the education system. Uh, and it was really confronting because I grew up in a community that was both quite strong in culture, but on the other hand, a lot of the community, the non-Indigenous community, saw being Aboriginal as being a bad thing. We were the drug addicts, we were the alcoholics, we, were the, um, we weren't gonna go anywhere, we weren't gonna go to uni, um, and we were probably gonna be victims of domestic violence. That was the stereotype. And uh, so my exposure to the education system when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander true histories was non-existent. Uh, it wasn't until I came down to Sydney to finish my schooling um, that I found other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young ones my age or a little bit younger who were proud of who they were, who we come in all different shades. And I know that it's quite common for us to be judged by the color of our skin. And I remember going through shops and my cousins would be followed because they were slightly darker than I was, but I could get away with uh, not being followed because I was lighter skinned. And so I would be both judged by my own community as well as by non-Indigenous peoples because of the color of my skin. And so the sense of pride in who I was didn't happen until I was 16 going on 17. And I had somebody say, being Aboriginal isn't just good, it's great. Um, and I had to go on my own learning journey uh, about learning my culture, which is Bundjalung culture, and then going deeper, the Widjibal Wiable of Bundjalung culture, um, because prior to that, I had no idea. And so I've been working for RA in Narragunoli for going on five years this year, which is crazy. Um, but the reason why I said yes to this was because prior to that, I had the wonderful opportunity to go around to rural and remote Aboriginal and Torres Islander communities uh, and run workshops in Aboriginal science and tech. And I saw similar stories to my own. An education system that was largely part of the problem when it comes to the stolen generations, when it comes to that assimilation, that just literally cycled through Aboriginal and Torres Islander kids and then pushed them out to either be uh, house workers or um, working on the fields, and that was all we could amount to be. Um, having that kind of a, a system, I knew that I had to do something. So being an English history high school trained, um, I graduated in 2013. I have never taught in a Western classroom since I graduated. Um, I decided to step up and make a difference in a positive way and in the only way that I could see that I had agency myself. And so I've been working with Narragona Wally with the idea of positively influencing policies, because if we are to make change, we need other people to walk with us. Unfortunately, due to the stolen generations, due to the frontier wars, due to the history in this country, the true histories of this country where we have been so horrifically marginalized, we're a minority. We have been fighting for so long to get our voices heard. And 2020 was like a culmination of that. It was like this thing where everyone, not just Aboriginal and Torres communities who've been knowing this history has been happening for a long time, but everyone was confronted with these inequities that we have in society. Um, that I was like, we need, we need to change. And our educators, uh, if you look at statistics and percentages, uh, a young one spends 60% of their life going through childhood in a school. The other percentage is at home and in community. That school life needs to change so that, uh, like you said earlier, um, our schools are actually prepared for our kids. 
so that we can then be powerful in who we are and actually uh, feel pride in ourselves and more than that, so that non-Indigenous kids can actually feel proud of being in a country where we've got the oldest living, continuing civilizations and cultures in the entire world. The resilience of our peoples and of our histories and cultures has been amazing. So why aren't they in the textbooks? Why aren't people talking about them positively? Um, which is what I loved about this story and about Duan and his community was because his story, unfortunately, isn't unique. But the way that it is told allows us to see that there is agency for change. All you have to do is actually listen. I think that's really right, Zoe. And I think, like, obviously, I I'm, I'm certainly do not take a position of being an expert in this field, but lots of people say, well, what needs to be done? You know, like, how, what needs to change? And I think, you know, what I've learned is that you just lean on the beautiful wisdoms and strengths of um, what is already there. And they don't actually need new solutions because First Nations communities have know exactly what they need and been calling for it for over 233 years. So um, I think that it might be, yeah, what is really wonderful is this story of um, children's ground and what Duane's own grandmothers are doing already. Um, William, it might be really nice just to hear you um, explain a little bit more about Children's Ground. Um, but for those who haven't heard of it, it is um, a model of systems change. So it is about education, but it's actually about um, an entire holistic model where the organisation grows with children from birth for a whole generation, supporting and growing them as they as they reach you know, adulthood and working with the entire wraparound community. Um, and I think that yeah, there is the kind of the work that needs to be done within mainstream schools and within universities and how can we shift what is already there. But we need to be looking at an entirely different model because it's different pedagogy, it's different ways of thinking. And that I think is what's going to really lead the revolution in the education space. Um, William, do you want to speak a little bit more about um, how Children's Ground is addressing systemic change, um, maybe particularly in education? Well, yeah, Maya, um, what was up the, um, yeah, sadly, um, and I mean sadly, right across the world, um, many, many First Nations communities have embraced this and have developed their own education systems. The Maoris have done it in New Zealand, in Hawaii, in Alaska. Um, they do it. Sadly, Australia has not done it. Um, even today, um, we still, with NAIDOC just gone recently, and I've heard ad nauseum the talk about reconciliation and working together. Um, I've heard that um, every NAIDOC, 26th of January or whatever, Australia Day or whatever it is, uh, that people want to celebrate or not celebrate. It's all this talk about working together as Australians. Uh, yet we forget that our education system goes back 65,000 years and that has never ever been embraced. That has never been taken hold of and says, let's uh, incorporate that, especially for Aboriginal children. You know, you're taught from your grandfather and your grandmother from birth. You know, mum and dad are insignificant. It's grandfather and grandmother that has that responsibility. And they're the ones that teach you. They're the ones that same skin as you. They're the ones that will show you the way that um, life is for indigenous people. And we, we've never, Australia has never taken that on, you know? And then at the end of the day, that means dollars. We can't get any real funding from any government to support us. We rely entirely on philanthropic 
and at times and in, under this COVID situation, uh, that's getting more and more scarce. It's like hen's teeth. We can't get anything really from um, people who want to support us. But, you know, it, it runs against the grain. It runs against the status quo. And sadly, many of those people are Aboriginal people who want to maintain the status quo in order to preserve and protect their jobs and their comfort. You know, and I find that the, you, you buy into assimilation and you believe in assimilation at the end of the day, you know, you become part of the, the, the problem. You, you, you're, not, you're not part of the solution. And the solution is to stop talking about it and do it. And that's what Children's Ground is. We've stopped talking about um, educating our children in an Aboriginal way, and we're doing it. But we're doing it at, large, at a large expense, not only to um, financially, but to ourselves. But we, we will keep doing it because that's what every Aboriginal grandparent will tell you. Right across Australia, I want my children strong in culture, identity, language, and law, and, and to know what, what uh, they're all about. They also want them to do mainstream education as well, so that they can accommodate the uh, Western systems. You know, I've, I've talked to people, Africans, Chinese, Jewish, who all said, I've grown up in my own culture. I've grown up Jewish. I went to Jewish schools, but now I sit here as one of Australia's leading lawyers. You know, so that is, there's no reason why this can't be embraced. There's no reason why this can't be taken on, but the system doesn't permit it. The system is, no, you go to school when you're five and that's it, off you go. You know, education starts at an early age. Education starts the day you're born, you know? And if your parents grow, grew up in a system that has been abusive and, and you know, you've got um, early childhood adversity in them, that system is still with them. Let's change it. Let's make a difference. And, you know, if you don't, if somebody doesn't stand up and say, stop, we've had enough, you know, um, the system will go on and it'll act as if normal. Everything's normal, everything's hunky-dory, but the mm -hmm. statistics will forever and a day show the big gap within the systems. You know, the mm -hmm. statistics of closing the gap and all these sort of things will forever and a day be there mm -hmm. because we, we don't deal with the fundamentals of empowerment and agency. We don't give people a voice. We don't allow them because the moment you spoke up in the early days, you were ostracized, you never got rations. You were pushed aside, you, you became a troublemaker because you wanted to enforce your culture, your language, your identity. And now media paints us as the angry black fellows who are just yelling and screaming for no reason. So we're still being marginalized now because we can't, get angry and show how we truly feel that pain, exactly. that yeah. anger just gets turned against us because exactly. people don't realize that intergenerational trauma mm. is still with us. It doesn't just disappear um, as a, a new day goes by. We carry that with but us. We can eliminate that in the next generation by strengthening them from an early, early age, making them grow up in a far more secure, I mean, children's ground. I mean, we went. We were at um, uh, one major community. I won't mention the name, and uh, we had sixty-seven people working with us for us who never had jobs before. And these are parents, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers who, who worked with the children. And this is a something uh, that. The system today cannot even accommodate or even create because it's not our system. It's a system and that belongs to someone else. It's a absolutely. prescribed solution. You know, we, we grew up um, uh, believing that, oh, we were 
made to believe that we weren't capable of independent rational thought. We are. We have that ability and we got to use that. And if we don't use it and say, stop, we've had enough, it becomes the norm. Yeah. I mean, just imagine, I mean, I'm not um, expert on world affairs, but if the people of America didn't stand up and say stop to Trump, the racism would be perpetuated even greater. If you had people, you know, said, no, nah, we, we want you, we want um, you as president. Just imagine what would happen mm -hmm. if some people hadn't stood up and said stop. Which showcases the power of the masses and the multiple voices. And it also showcases the strength and the power of community organizations such as Children's Ground. Um, and I would encourage if you haven't heard of it, if you haven't looked up Children's Ground before, please do. Um, these kind of organizations, as you said, really need this kind of community support. Mm -hmm. um, and they are doing amazing, amazing work from the grassroots level. Um, and so definitely jump on board with that. Um, we might share some links for a couple of different um, organizations and things to get involved uh, and different campaigns that are mentioned today. Um, so you guys can all uh, follow that up and take action yourselves, which is really important. It's giving you guys the agency to also walk with us. Um, the, uniqueness of, the uniqueness about Children's Ground, it's, you know, I might be uh, the chair and Jane Vatavalu is the CEO, but we're servants to the people. We're not there to um, think, we make sure administration ticks along. Yeah. It's the people who drive the whole thing. It's the grandmothers and the grandparents. It's yeah. the mothers and the fathers. Yeah. They drive it, they make the decision. Oh, let, we'll, we'll do this today. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We'll do it. And that's what we do. It's their, their agency, their organisation, it's their voice. And yet our own people don't recognise that because, as I said, they want to maintain the status quo of assimilation. Mm. Thanks. You know, how yeah. wrong is that? I mean, oh. we need that support. Yeah. We need it desperately. We need that community support. We need financial support. And we're struggling, yeah. you know, against the margins and we do that we have some good philanthropic people people who have no relationship with aboriginal people at all have come to the party and says yes we'll back you you know we can't even get that from our own people we can't even get that from our own government i think um william we might be coming to the end of the session but um i think if that's not a call to action then i don't know what is so <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty encouraging and I think it's a really good I'm example of how right. we can <laughs> you're just getting started yeah. uh, on with those things connected I know I know we're trying to listen to you on these um but yeah I just wanted to just as a final thing about the film um I've got a few little slides that are just some of the impact work and Dwan at um the UN just to have a final look at and I just thought um yeah, for those if there's a takeaway, it really is just the power of using storytelling to be able to back and amplify the work of um, um, communities that have been working in this and in education reform for a long time. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, all of us and all the families are really proud of that work. That storytelling we've done. the right way. Yeah. I think is really important. So, um, so yeah, thanks so much, William, and thanks so much, um, Zoe.